Hello, BookTube, and welcome to Mr. Freeze's Lair, <laughs> otherwise known as Hyde Cottage. We had our first cold night, really cold night last night, and yesterday was no was no warmth fest anyway. The night temperatures went down pretty low, and once again, as happens every year, this drafty, creaky, cold, chilly old house was caught completely off guard by that, <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> I'm supposed to get heated. <sighs> I also was caught off guard, so uh, the place is... Uh, it's slow to warm up, then the windows are 130 years old, they just sieve the heat, so it's uh, it's been a rough uphill day. <laughs> On top of which, the uh, electronic space heaters that I have used as an absolute lifeline for the last few years, since my girls were sick, I, I, got, I went out and got space heaters just to make their lives more comfortable and then realized, oh my god, how nice this is. Uh, and so, as you can tell from that tedious anecdote, these space heaters worked for a long time, worked perfectly fine for a long time. They have suddenly stopped working perfectly fine. I don't know if something needs if, uh, something needs to be done down in the bowels of the house. Maybe an electricity needs to be brought in and see if maybe some fuses are going out or are old or if that even happens to fuses. I know for sure that uh, <clears throat> they were not a problem for years. And then now, now all of a sudden, I, I run one of them for an hour and it, it blows a fuse or, or triggers a breaker. And I can't do that, but I don't see how I can get through a Boston winter without localized sources of heat. So <laughs> anyway, we've got some mail. Uh, poignant enough, since this is the last mail haul of the week. It's a fairly good, uh, healthy mail haul for the day, and, and it ends in some boxes. Uh, so let's see what we have in here, see if there's something squill-worthy enough take my mind off the cold. <laughs> so uh, this first one is fairly heavy. We could have lots of uh, finished copies here. It is, uh, it's, it's always hard to remember, but there, you know, the year still has life left in it. So that means it's the first week in November. There is a little while left in the book season before the new year starts. So, uh, okay, what is this first one? It is from MIT Press. Huh, okay. All right, this is due in a, in a week. It's a $50 hardcover. And since it's a $50 hardcover from MIT Press, I'm assuming your bookstore won't have it. You'll have to, you mean you'll now you'll know that it exists. You can order it. Uh, and this is by Jacqueline Bass, and it's Marcel Duchamp and the Art of Life. I got the camera angled correctly here. I'm trying to give the Holy Nimbus of Light as little real estate as possible, but you want to see the books as well. So this is a big new art release from MIT, a groundbreaking reading of Duchamp's work as informed by Asian es esoterism, energetic spiritual practices identifying creative energy with the erotic impulse. Uh, okay, so this is generously illustrated and the author is the director emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley's Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Uh, and, uh, this comes out in on the 19th of November is the date. I'm sure that that's not strict, but I can't review it. <laughs> I know nothing at all about anything even remotely connected with this book. No idea why I got it. Certainly in MIT's uh, catalog uh, for the fall and the early winter, there are lots of other books that I would want that I didn't, that I haven't got yet. Um, wow, okay. <laughs> all right, that was, we have a baffling, we're off to a baffling start. So let's see if we can't claw our way back to... Uh, Western history or dead Kennedys or something like that. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay, great. Fantastic. All right, much, much better. Uh, this is also a December release, I think. Uh, no, no paperwork. No, no, no paperwork. Okay, but I think this is a December release. Uh, it doesn't seem to have a sheet in it anywhere. Uh, this is from Yale University Press, the wonderful folks at Yale University Press. Oh, this is lovely. The finished copy is lovely. I've already read this, but I'm, I will happily go through it again. This is edited by uh, Cliff Eisen and Dominic McHugh, and it is The Letters of Cole Porter. Big, thick thing from Yale, and uh, it's fantastic. I'm a fan of letter collections anyway, uh, but this, this is superb. Uh, from the musicals Paris and Anything Goes to Kiss Me Kate and High Society, Cole Porter left a lasting legacy of iconic songs, including You're the Top, Love for Sale, and Night and Day. Alongside his creative and professional success, Porter had an exuberant, if angst-ridden, personal life. He married a rich, older divorcee, but continually worried about money. He went to extravagant parties and had numerous affairs with male lovers, but was left crippled for much of his adult life by a horse-riding accident. 
Uh, and this extensive collection of letters dates from the first decade of the 20th century to the early 1960s and features all sorts of high-profile correspondence. In addition to lots of people that he just knew in his life, it features Irving Berlin, uh, Ethel Merman, uh, all, Orson Welles, all sorts of other people. Uh, and it's also generously footnoted, so that, so that, which is great. In a letter collection, that's kind of what you want. You kind of want the, the the editors are really key in productions like this because you're not going to know a lot of the conversational details in the correspondence, and you're going to need to to appreciate the wit of the letters. So uh, it's generously footnoted so that you will not be left behind, which is great. Uh, uh, great. So let's see. Let's see what this next one is. Uh, let's see what have we got here? An extravagant note <laughs> from. A publicist friend? Uh, does this not have a sheet either? Oh my god, it does not. This does not have a sheet either. This is a January release. Uh, this is the, the new Lars Kepler. Are these translated? It's terrible. I've actually I've read both two of them and I've reviewed one of them and I still can't remember. Yes, translated from the Swedish by Neil Smith. Uh, this is called The Rabbit Hunter. Uh, and these are terrific. <laughs> these is a writing a writing team that goes by the name of Lars Kepler, and they're terrific for uh, a police procedural serial killer thriller novels. I don't think there's any better. There's any better series of books coming out than these. These are they're just terrific, mindless in the way that such books always are. But oh boy, you won't care. <laughs> you won't care. So what have we got for the rabbit? The rabbit hunter, an alcoholic celebrity chef. His reputation-obsessed manager and his sullen, rebellious son all get sucked into what at first appears to be a terrorist attack. When Swedish foreign minister is murdered, the prime minister summons Juna Lina, Juna Lina, uh, to a meeting. That's one of the one of the, the author's main characters. Lina is finishing out a sentence at Kumla prison for assaulting an officer in the course of his last investigation. But with the body count mounting and a police at a loss, all hope is on Lina to find the killer and neutralize the threat, so he's granted a temporary release. He teams up with Saga Bauer, a tough-as-nails security police detective, uh, and soon it becomes clear that they are dealing with something far more complex than anyone imagined. Their search for the killer takes them across the country and to the hallowed halls of an elite Swedish boarding school, but one person who holds the key to solving the baffling series of murders is locked in a Chicago psychiatric home. <laughs> and uh, if this is anything like... Uh, the others I haven't read. I don't think I've read everything by these two authors. I think I've read, I read uh, the Sandman, which I absolutely loved, and Stalker, which was the one that came right after that, and loved that too. So uh, I'm all for it. This comes out in January. That's great. Uh, that's great. Uh, and that is the last of our conventional Manila envelopes. Now we have a, uh, a special kind of, it's like some kind of FedEx package. Uh, but I'm, I'm assuming it's a book, <laughs> not anything else. Because uh, when, when uh, periodically Deb will try to serve me with papers, but she always does that in person. <laughs> she likes the personal touch. Huh. Oh, all right. Oh, great. Fantastic. Okay, this is a copy of, uh, boy, still no pub sheet. This is amazing. This is uh, three books in a row with no documentary material. This comes out in April of 2020. It sounds really good. Uh, it's by Gil Hornby, and it's called Miss Austin. But not the Miss Austin that you think. Not the first one that comes to mind. I wonder if I can get a description in the book since I don't have the pub sheet in this copy. New, no, new, no, new, no. new. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Uh, okay, well, uh, it's about Cassandra Austin uh, and her search for documentation about her famous sister when her sister is dead, but also copious I gather copious amounts of stuff about Cassandra just in general and about their world and their life uh, that is the Miss Austin referred to in the title it's going to be uh, it comes out in in April and it's going to be a a big release Jane Austen novel Jane Austen related Jane Austen novel uh, I think it's probably going to get reviewed absolutely everywhere uh, and it might be that I will love it I tend to have really good luck with Jane Austen adjacent book productions of any kind whether it's Longbourn by Joe Baker which was a, a retelling of Pride and Prejudice from the servant's point of view uh, or the, there was a whole series of, of novels of very, very lush historical novels telling about the, the 
the events of Pride and Prejudice after what happened after Pride and Prejudice. A lot of those books were really good. Uh, there was a series of books starring Jane Austen as the solver of murder mysteries. Those were surprisingly entertaining, surprisingly good. That series might even still be going on. I think the author's name was Baron, B-A-R-R-O-N. Uh, but even something like, uh, there was a little nonfiction book uh, about a guy who descends or enters into the world of Jane Austen's super fandom. The Jane Austen conventions where you wear period clothing and you speak in period lingo and you drink and eat period foods. And the, even that book was absolutely wonderful. So, so I have good luck with these sorts of things. Uh, pretty much the only one that left me flat was uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which it's, I thought it had clever turns of phrase, but they were usually pretty easy. Uh, Pride and Prejudice is, among, among many other things, a very easy book to parody. Uh, but So I'm looking forward to this. Absolutely. Especially since it looks to me, from the back, uh, it looks to me like uh, a couple of the blurbs are from Jane Austen authorities. Not fellow novelists or fellow writers of historical fiction, but people who know Jane Austen. Claire Tomlin is the first blurb. She wrote a great biography of, of Jane Austen. So, uh, so there you go. We'll be talking more about this in the new year, I have a feeling. I don't think I'll review it for... The Christian Science Monitor, I kind of like to do nonfiction. I will review it for open letters, of course, but I wouldn't miss it for the world. Uh, let's let's move on here. Let's let's charge on. Uh, this next one is a slim package from Princeton, and now all I'm hoping is that it has a pup sheet. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm kind of lost without... Oh, uh, okay. Oh, great. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, all right, I'm of two minds on this thing, and I'm, uh, I'm hoping that the the better angel on the, on the right hand shoulder is correct. This is by John Cag, and it's called Six Souls Healthy Minds How William James Can Save Your Life. That is the cover of the book. Comes out in March. Uh, and the, the hopeful part of me, the, the, the happy part of me to see this book, it's a tiny little thing, take an hour to read, uh, is that I don't think William James gets nearly enough attention. He is the interesting James brother. <laughs> but, uh, and nobody knows his writings. For every 250 people who've read the Bostonians, you'll find maybe one person who's read a variety of religious experiences, and that's a shame. Uh, but the thing that draws me back, the thing that gives me pause, is that this author wrote a book called Hiking with Nietzsche that I thought was terrible. Just terrible. I f it was about the same kind of thing, slim kind of, you know, how does literature affect your life? And I finished Hiking with Nietzsche actually feeling sorry for Nietzsche, who's an author I hate. <laughs> it just seemed like, okay, it, it that I seemed to me when I finished that book like it should have been called Hiking with the Wikipedia entry on Nietzsche, on Nietzsche, and I I would hate to see that done for William James, but I don't see how it could be. I don't see how you could do that with William James. You can tell right away the minute you dip your toe into his work that he's not insane <laughs> like Nietzsche, and he's not easily summarizable either. So, uh, well, let's see, let's see here. In in 1895, William James, father of American philosophy, delivered a lecture called Is Life Worth Living. It is if you have dogs. <laughs> uh, the lecture was not theoretical for James, who had contemplated suicide during an existential crisis as a young man. Six Souls, Healthy Minds is an examination of James's life and thought, exploring why the founder of pragmatism and empirical psychology and an inspiration for Alcoholics Anonymous can still speak so directly and profoundly to anyone struggling to make a life worth living. Okay, so it might not, this book might not be grappling with his literature at all. Uh, just the themes of his literature. Uh, John Cagg shows how James's experience as one of what he called the sick souled, those who think that life might be meaningless, drove him to articulate an ideal healthy-mindedness, an attitude toward life that is open, active, and hopeful, but also realistic about its risks. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm all for it. I, I am, uh, up, up to a certain discrete point, I am willing to forgive an author for what I consider to be a, mis a misfire of a previous book. Uh, and any, any book that is an energetic, popular release examination of an author like William James, who most people don't know and most people should, is perfectly fine by me. So again, we will be talking more about this book. Uh, uh, so let's see, let's move on here. Very uh, uh, Typically for this channel, the mail is literally all over the place. <laughs> just, just, just everywhere. So what is this next one? Uh... 
Okay. All right. This is a uh, new in paperback? Yes, new in paperback. Oh, lordy, 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 look at all these blurbs. Good lord. It's not just that there are a lot of blurbs, it's that they're very long. People can't shut up about this thing. One of the blurbs comes from Transmission Press. I don't believe that exists. <laughs> I don't believe there is such a thing. Boston Herald, Jewish Book Council, Canadian Bookworm. Is there such a thing as Canadian Bookworm? Why am I not writing for these places? <laughs> Good Lord. But also the New York Times Book Review, the New Yorker, Library Journal gave it a starred review, and it just goes on and on. This is incredible. The New Republic, uh, Economic and Political Weekly, Jewish Book World again, and a whole bunch of authors. Okay, so this comes out in paperback at the end of November. This is 1947, Where Now Begins, by Elizabeth Asprink. There's a weird thing over the A in her name, so for all I know, it's pronounced OO. Uh, but what have we got here? If I can somehow find a description amidst all this hyperventilating praise. <laughs> this is new in paperback in this month, in November. Uh, and in it, the book traces a year that marked a paradigm shift in modern history. A year this book comes to reveal that defined the modern world as we know it today. Okay, so it saw a world in turmoil, concurrently grappling with the legacy of World War II, the fascism of the Nazi regime and its expansion across Europe, and the emergence of the word genocide from the Nuremberg trials. The West pivot from declaring never again to the Cold War, all while key strongholds of the British Empire crumbled, resulting in fallout around the world from India to Palestine. I, I'm, I'm having, a, I hate to say this, but I'm having a terrible time remembering if I read this book. It seems like I wouldn't have missed it. Uh, I'll have to check. It's not ringing an immediate bell right now, but uh, good lord, the paperback comes highly recommended. That's, that is incredible. Uh, okay, so I don't, I, I, I don't think I need any of this, but I'll, I'll put some of it in here. Okay, so we have a paperback release. We're moving closer and closer to the boxes. We have one more envelope to go, I believe. Yes, and then the box. Uh, box just hit the floor. What is this next one? Here, let's get you up here. Oh, that the bigger of the two boxes is very light. It could have something very small in it. Uh, oh, God help us. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> All right. I have been putting this book off, and that's not fair. I shouldn't do that. I, uh, so I will read this uh, this weekend. I will, I will read this this weekend. Oh, my. I shouldn't put this off. Uh... Okay, so this is, we've seen this already. This is from David Head, and this is A Crisis of Peace. George Washington, The New Burr Conspiracy, and the Fate of the American Revolution. It's another work of, uh, I guarantee you, Washington had geography, I guarantee it. Uh, on March 15th, 1783, so when all but the shooting match was over, General George Washington addressed a group of angry officers in an effort to rescue the American Revolution from mutiny at the highest level. After the British surrender at Yorktown, the American Revolution still blazed on, <clears throat> a fact that far too, America, far too few Americans even know. Uh, and as peace was negotiated in Europe, grave problems surfaced at home. The government was broke, paying its debts with loans from France. Political rivalry among the states paralyzed Congress. The army's officers encamped near Newburgh, New York, and restless without an enemy to fight, brooded over a civilian population seemingly indifferent to their sacrifices. Uh, the result was the Newburgh Affair, a mysterious event in which Continental Army officers, disgruntled by a lack of pay and pensions, may have collaborated with nationalist-minded politicians such as Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and Robert Morris to pressure Congress and the states to approve new taxes and strengthen the federal government. Fearing what his men might do with their passions inflamed, Washington averted the crisis, but with the nation's problems persisting, the officers ultimately left the army disappointed their low opinion of their civilian countrymen confirmed. A crisis of peace provides a fresh look at the end of the American Revolution while speaking to issues that concern us still. The fragility of civil-military relations, how even victorious wars end ambiguously, and what veterans and civilians owe to each other. And this is one of those very unfortunate books that's come, that comes out in early December. Uh, so it's not going to get, I don't think it's going to get much in the way of, uh, of mainstream attention, but it will get attention from me. I will put this on the list and read it right away. Uh, hmm. uh, okay, well, well, we'll see. That that summary of the Newburgh conspiracy 
was not encouraging, but we, we will see. We will see. It, it could be that uh, the it could obviously be that the book has more nuance than that. That would be that would be fantastic. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Let's see what this next one is. We're uh, running out of room on the old lap here. It's one of the one of the uh, structural drawbacks of not doing this in the little book room. In the little book room, I can just pile things on the floor. Uh, sooner or later, sooner rather than later, this the cold of this place is going to drive me in there. Uh, but even there, I wonder. I wonder what will happen in the little book room, because that has an electric space heater too. Now that electric space heater has worked perfectly fine for six years. If it starts blowing fuses, then there's got to be something wrong with the fuses. I, anyway, anyway. Okay, so this is another, effectively a December release. This is the, the very end of November. Uh, and this is something we've also seen before. This is uh, Philip Hare, T-H-E-R, and it's translated by Jeremiah Reimer, and it's called The Outsiders. Refugees in Europe since 1492. We've got a bunch of famous refugees poorly drawn on the cover there. <laughs> uh, introducing a major history of refugees and asylum seekers. This book is a rich narrative filled with biographical sketches of well-known figures like Hannah Arendt, Hannah Arendt and Madeleine Albright, as well as many lesser-known ones, in exploring over 500 years of history. Uh, the Outsiders gives modern readers a broad and informative look at persecution, the journey, and the reception of refugees over time. Okay. All right. So this comes out in late uh, November. Who is the author? He's a professor of Central European History at the University of Vienna. And he's written a number of books. And he lives in Vienna. Okay. All right. So this comes out in the end of November. I have had the advanced copy of this. Haven't got to it. This or the Washington book. The Washington book still comes first, but uh, a number of these things, either to read or to reread, have to go right on the on the docket. And then we'll do the last one. This last one is a, a bigger box, but it's light as a feather. It, it could be only one book, and that book might be a mass market paperback or something like that. Uh, the box is not coming quietly, but let's, let's see what we have here. Okay, it's one book. Uh, Oh my god. It's from Harvard University Press. It's another Renaissance Italy book. Good lord. We had uh, we had Giannazzo Manetti just last week. Now we have another one. Thank god for academic presses, I swear. Uh, okay, so this is uh, by T Tamar Herzig, who is a director of the Morris E. Curiel Institute of European Studies and professor of history at Tel Aviv University. Beautiful Tel Aviv. And she's published extensively on various aspects of the Italian Renaissance. And this is uh, a convert's tale. Uh, interesting. How interesting. Uh, with the subtitle, Art, Crime, and Jewish Apostasy in Renaissance Italy. That is the, uh, that is the cover. Uh, in 1491, the renowned goldsmith Salomone de Sesso converted to Catholicism. Born in mid-15th century to a Jewish family in Florence, Salomone later settled in Ferrara, where he was regarded as a virtuoso artist whose exquisite jewelry and lavishly engraved swords were prized by Italy's ruling elite. But rumors circulated about his behavior, scandalizing the Jewish community, who turned him over to civil authorities, charged with sodomy. You knew it was going to be that. Uh, he was sentenced to die, but agreed to renounce Judaism to save his life. He was baptized, taking the name Ercole de Fedeli, one of the faithful, is how roughly how it translates, with the hope of powerful patrons, with the help of powerful patrons like Duchess Eleonora of Aragon and Duke Ercole de Este, his namesake. Ercole lived as a practicing Catholic for more than three decades. Drawing on newly discovered archival sources, the author traces the dramatic story of his life, half a century before ecclesiastical authorities made Jewish conversion a priority of the Catholic Church. Interesting. Oh, that is so interesting. They made him convert rather than face death. How does that work exactly? If he was convicted of sodomy, if the Catholic Church knew that, it was a capital crime for the Catholic Church, they maybe didn't believe the Jewish authorities? <laughs> I don't know this story. And that is so wonderful. That is such a wonderful feeling. I don't know this story. And now I want to. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. 
Okay, so this comes out in early December. This is part of the Itati studies in uh, Renaissance history. I bet the Minato book is too. Uh, the Minati book is probably the same thing. They look similar. Just the cover design looks similar. Uh, fantastic. Okay, so this is early December. And it also goes on the list right away. Okay, well, that's, that's the way of it, right? We've seen that on this channel, that oftentimes a mail hall will also function as a TBR for me. A lot of times the, the finished copies will suddenly be reminders to me that I, I put this off too long and I need to get to this book. And that's happened a few times here. Plus, some of them are just plain interesting. <laughs> so, baby, how are you doing? My little girl. No, don't do that. Frida, leave the plastic alone. Leave the plastic alone, little girl. No, no, no. You have... The floor is literally covered with dog toys. She's a spoiled little princess. <laughs> so let's see. We have a convert's tail. The Steve pyramids especially are going to be hard because I know you want to see the Steve pyramid, but I also know you want to see my face. Uh, so we have the convert's tail, or a convert's tail. We have the outsiders, refugees since 1492. Uh, we have a crisis of peace. A reinterpretation of one or a new new study, a new new telling of uh, one tense moment in Washington's command of the Continental Army. Uh, then we have uh, the letters of Cole Porter. Boy, oh boy, <laughs> what a volume! So endlessly entertaining. Uh, let's see what what else. What are we doing here? We have this Marcel Duchamp study that I, I really don't know what to do with. I don't know why it was sent to me. Uh, we have uh, the latest Lars Kepler. This comes out in the, early in the new year. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, Miss Austin by Gil Hornby uh, about Cassandra Austin, but also largely about uh, Jane as well. Uh, then we have 1947, universally praised, <laughs> uh, and Hel Six Souls, Healthy Minds, a new little book on uh, William James, at least mostly on William James. So there you go. That is the, uh, the mail hall, the last mail hall of the week. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to wrap this up and see if I can entertain her highness for a little while. <laughs> she seems to be bored and that seems to be my responsibility. <laughs> so I will go do that. <laughs> but I will be back. Thank you book 2.